Hello and thank you for joining us. I'm Wilson Stribling. Welcome to another edition of At Issue, where we discuss and debate the issues facing the state of Mississippi and how these issues impact you. Headlining At Issue tonight, Governor Tate Reeves delivers his first State of the State address. Later in the program, our political analysts will break down the speech and take a closer look at what the governor is proposing. But first, it's National School Choice Week. Parents, teachers, and more than 800 children from Mississippi charter, public, and private schools rallied outside the Capitol earlier this week. School choice advocates are urging lawmakers to renew the education scholarship account program, which ends this year. According to the State Department of Education, a little over 500 students receive the scholarship funds. Grant Callen is with the nonprofit Empower Mississippi. He tells MPB's Desiree Frazier the program provides about $6,500 to special needs students to help pay for tuition or special services at non-traditional public schools. Many of the parents who are on the Education Scholarship Account Program uh, were here today really just to say thank you. We're five years in. It has been a life-changing program for many of them who, are ha who are, have access now to schools they wouldn't have been able to afford otherwise. Many students are at St. Richard's or New Summit or Magnolia Speech School uh, or the 3D School in Petal or, or other schools around the state using that Education Scholarship Account Program. So the parents are here to say thank you and certainly to ask lawmakers to renew it. The peer committee report found that there isn't enough accountability in the program and funds weren't always distributed the way they should and some students were going to private schools but were getting the special needs services they needed. Well, the Education Scholarship Account Program was intentionally set up different than the way we do traditional public education. Traditional public education has mountains and mountains of bureaucracy and red tape and it hasn't delivered a great education for kids with special needs. In fact, we've left behind kids with special needs for years. And so the ESA program was intentionally designed with a new type of accountability, really a stronger type of accountability, which says parents, if their kids are not, if their needs are not being met, they can walk away and take their scholarship with them. And so schools are now through the ESA program directly accountable to parents to make sure their kids are getting what they need. So it has great accountability. Even the peer report said there was no, there was no, they found no fraud. Um, it was, it, it's just a different type of accountability because it's more accountable to the parents than it is to the state. In 2018, a state oversight committee found more accountability is needed in the education scholarship program. Nancy Loom with the Parents Campaign says the program has a number of flaws. She says less than half the children given the vouchers have not used them because parents are telling the private, telling her that private schools will not admit their children or they don't provide the special services their children need. Loom says some parents also say they can't afford to pay the school's expenses beyond what the voucher provides. This program was designed to use taxpayer dollars to fund private schools. If you read the statute, it was absolutely designed to funnel money to private schools. There really are, there's no power given to parents. It says that the parent to be eligible for the vouchers, these are all children with special needs who qualify, but to be eligible, the parent must rescind the child's right to special education services, the, the right to the, the federal law that, that says that those children must be provided those services. Um, it also says that the private schools can pick and choose, they can deny admission to any child they don't want to serve. The private schools do not have to provide any special education services at all. These are all for children with special needs. They, they don't have to report anything. In fact, the law says they cannot be required to be accountable in any way for the quality of education they provide or anything that they do with our tax dollars. This law was written to get money, public money, to private schools. It really is not written to benefit students. Public schools, on the other hand, are, are held accountable every day for the quality of education they provide. They are required to provide every single service that a child with special needs qualifies for in the child's IEP. Um, there's a completely different standard. And so it's just not appropriate to say, oh, we're going to give, in fact, more money per child to these private schools that can pick and choose their students, do with it what they will, the money, and not report anything to taxpayers. That simply is not an appropriate use of, of our tax dollars. 
House Republican Richard Bennett of Long Beach chairs the Education Committee. He also says the voucher program has a lot of problems and that the legislature needs to evaluate it before extending it. Here's what some other lawmakers have to say about the Education Scholarship Account program. Many times we're, we're giving money to parents who are dysfunctional to begin with. Some of these issues are, are familial. And so you have parents who, who aren't capable to start with, and then it, you give them this money, it's complicated. So I think personally that we need to rein in the ESA program, we need to pull it in, we need to let that money go to credential programs where the taxpayers know what we're getting for our money. I'm not in support of it, and uh, I've met with several educators all across the state. My, my position is, uh, we fund the public schools, let's fund the public schools, let's give the public schools the money and the uh, necessary tools to educate all children. In his first State of the State address on Monday, Governor Tate Reeves talked about supporting school choice and increasing teacher pay. Among a host of other priorities, he announced the closing of parts of Unit 29 at the State Penitentiary at Parchman. Prison issues have dominated much of Reeves' time since he was inaugurated earlier this month. At least 13 inmates have died in state custody since late December, most of them at Parchman. Unit 29 has been rocked by deadly violence and beset by longstanding problems like broken toilets and moldy showers. Here is some, here is some of what the governor said. I've been to Parchman. I saw it for myself just a few days ago. The problems were infuriating. There is no excuse. We can do better. We will right the wrongs of the past and we will do everything in our power to protect the dignity of every Mississippi life. All Mississippians must be able to trust that the people in charge of this system are acting with competence to keep them safe. We must be able to trust that the corrections officers operating these prisons have the tools that they need to do their jobs and that they are compensated fairly. We must be able to trust that this system shows a baseline level of respect to those who find themselves within it. We must administer justice fairly, respecting the dignity of all within our prison walls. Tommy Taylor is the interim corrections commissioner. He said after Reeves' speech on Monday that Unit 29 has about a dozen buildings, three of which are already closed. He says the department is working to make Unit 29 more livable while they undergo this transition. We have, we're making steps to have more staff there with uh, outside support at this time where they'll be safer and also the inmates will be safer. We're also making steps to uh, get the, the standard of, of living up while we're making progress in, in uh, trying to find other facilities to put these inmates. So uh, we've, we've uh, done a lot of work in the plumbing areas, the electrical areas, the heating and cooling. Well, they don't need any cooling, but uh, uh, repairing, uh, maintenance problems, uh, Roof leaks, all of this is ongoing at this time, right now, today. And uh, we'll be going until we can get these people either uh, in a safer place to go or in a safer and more standard of living where they are. The governor addressed a number of other issues during his speech. That issue producer Ashley Norwood gets reaction from lawmakers following his address. I thought it was really, really good. Uh, Governor Reeves set out a vision for the state. Um, I think that he recognized the issues that uh, we as a state and particularly the legislature uh, needs to address. Uh, I thought it was um, set a course for where we can, uh, can hope to be. And I thought for, for his first state of the state, uh, it was very well done, and uh, I just I, I thought it was was really good. He talked about um, a few things that will require money for sure: infrastructure, pay increases, and uh, even preparing to close down Unit 29, etc. So, with your affiliation with the Appropriations Committee, are you optimistic that we'll be able to get some of these things done with the budget? Yeah, and let me say, I think that his what he called for in that was not overly aggressive. I think uh, that. I think that it was uh, something 
that was within the bounds that we can look at. Now understand that we always have to be financially responsible. We have to balance the budget, unlike they do up in uh, Washington. And so the teacher pay raises, I think that that's uh, something that a lot of people around here are looking at, uh, which we in the legislature have already passed the uh, what the deficit budget for the pay raise last year. Um, I was glad to see he talked about uh, Unit 29. Um, that's going to, I'm sure all the, the moving around of the pieces are, is going to take funding. But because uh, with him as Lieutenant Governor, with uh, Governor Bryan and the, and the legislature in the past years, we are in a good position financially speaking. And those, as the governor said, Governor Reeves said, um, you know, we had to make some hard choices during the recession and all that, but we've put ourselves in a good position and we have to recognize that and, and keep moving forward in that vein. I'm encouraged uh, by the words of our governor. Uh, he spoke tonight about being a governor for all of Mississippi. And that's certainly uh, something that we've been working for uh, the seven years I've been here in the legislature. Uh, he laid out some plans uh, tonight, uh, of some things he wanted to do that uh, he feels would benefit all of the citizens that we serve. So if he uh, put action to those words, uh, uh, I think we can move forward. What are some of the issues he mentioned? Infrastructure, education, uh, the correction system. What are you most passionate about and what do you hope to see? Well, all of those issues are important. Uh, certainly, uh, uh, we need to do some more things in our state when it comes to infrastructure. Uh, Health care is, is one that I'm really passionate about that he uh, uh, really, uh, it, it didn't sound like uh, that uh, we would be doing the things that we think will work for our state. We think if you want to invest in health care, the, the best thing to do is to expand Medicaid in our state. And he didn't sound like he wanted to do that. But uh, I was uh, pleased to hear him talk about taking first steps to close down Unit 29 uh, there in Parchment uh, on the heels of all the things that's happened. So those things I was encouraged about. Bye. Anything you were discouraged by or something you didn't agree with? Uh, just uh, his take on, on health care for our state. Uh, I think that we uh, still have to work harder to do something to make sure that, that the 300,000 Mississippians, uh, working Mississippians, have a way to afford health care. So let's get straight to the point with views from both sides of the aisle. Brandon Jones is an attorney and former Democratic member of the House. Austin Barber is a national Republican strategist and founder of the Clearwater Group. Austin, Brandon, good to have both of you with us this week. Excuse me. Uh, as we just heard, the governor announced the closing of Unit 29 at Parchment in his State of the State address. He addressed the need to give prisons the tools they need. He did not, however, mention any uh, additional funding. Austin, how do you see him leading Mississippi out of this corrections crisis? Well, I think he's, you know, he's, he's acting, which is most important. Uh, these are issues that he inherited. Yes, he was lieutenant governor for eight years, but he did not have MDOC underneath him. Um, and he, he's acting. These are serious problems that are going on. A lot of these people are there for very bad reasons. Um, but we still have to make sure that we have a situation in all of our prisons, especially Parchment, because it's the most notorious, um, to where our correctional officers are secure and to where the prisoners inside the prison, of course, are secure themselves. And I applaud what the governor has done in, in moving forward and saying he's going to close this infamous Unit 29 and uh, moving those prisoners to another location, I assume. Yeah, this announcement about Unit 29 was the most dynamic part of his state of the state. It's important. It was newsworthy. Um, obviously, we want to see that happen quickly. I think that's an important logistical step towards a safer environment. One of the logistical pieces of this, I think it's important to see this as part of the whole because we have a sentencing problem in Mississippi. We have an over-incarceration crisis. Um, and so not only is it funding, there's also looking at the way we do sentencing. There's also being smart about how we do the logistics of these things. And I'll tell you, Austin, it's notable uh, launching a nationwide search for commissioner. Um, there is a discipline that goes into that task. There's a creativity to it. Um, it's good that we cast a large search to try to get the right person because it's just such an Big challenge. And, and I think it really is a nationwide search. We, we laugh sometimes when we hear, you know, football coaches do a nationwide search, but we search right. about, you know, a, a 10 mile radius. There's no question that's what the governor is doing. He's got a lot of people around him helping him try to figure that out. Yeah. 
Right, let's move on to uh, literacy. The governor highlighted uh, literacy growth, saying Mississippi is number one in the country for educational gains. Let's take a look. People around the world are beginning to notice. They look up from the national assessments and ask, what is happening in Mississippi? Why is this state, which we have derided for so long, the only state in the country that is making improvements in fourth grade reading? Why are these kids gaining ground while the rest of the country stays stagnant? I will let you in on a little secret. These gains are not accidental. A portion of the credit belongs to the education reform advocates who have fought tirelessly against the coalition of the status quo. Change is never easy, but Mississippi's education system needed change. Over the last eight years, those advocates have worked to reform our education system, creating more opportunity, choice, and access for Mississippi's most vulnerable students. Now, there has been a concerted effort to undermine and attack those reforms. But the results speak for themselves. We must hold the line against those who would undo the very reforms that are lifting children up. The governor goes on to praise students, parents, and teachers for their hand in the fourth grade reading gains. But we hear him start off by giving a considerable amount of credit to advocates. So, uh, Brandon, what did you take from that? And based on the governor's support of school choice, uh, and where do you see him uh, leading in terms of education in the four years ahead? Increasing the number of reading coaches in Mississippi public schools has proven very effective. Uh, the, the, Reading Gate has also proven to be effective. Um, and I would just remind folks that at the time the Reading Gate was passed, it was a bipartisan legislative proposal. Um, but the, those reading coaches have had a significant impact. I agree with Chairman Bennett of the House Education Committee that the education scholarship accounts lack accountability. Uh, they require at minimum a, a relook into how we're actually allocating those funds. Um, so I don't know that all of the things that we have tried have been successful. Um, but I, I think the, probably the most notable part was talking about the gains we've made, because we talk a lot about the gains we made. I think it's important to note that the reason Mississippi leads the nation in gains is because we had the far, farthest amount of ground to cover. So if you run a 20 minute mile and you shave it down to 15 minutes, then you might have shaved five minutes off of your mile time, but you're still slow. So we have a lot of ground to cover, and I think that's important to keep in mind. We've still got some ground to make up. Yeah, I sort of kind of laugh at Brandon when he says that because I look at it as sort of a false narrative there. Yes, we do have a long way to go, but they are making strides. These are policy decisions. This is what is very important. The, the, uh, the different programs that Brandon talked about are policy decisions that were passed under Republican leadership when Tate Reeves was Lieutenant Governor under Speaker Philip Gunn and when, and when uh, Phil Bryan as Governor. Brandon's right. Some, some of these did have Democrats, bipartisan support, and that is a good thing. We do have a long way to go. We are making strides. The state Senate has already passed a, a new teacher pay raise, one of the first acts that they passed. It's either $1,000 or $1,500 a year. I'm sorry, I don't know the exact number. These are good things Republicans continue to say. We gotta continue to do more things in education, including more choice, which is what we saw a very large diverse group there saying thank you to legislators for more choice to help the kids that truly need it in Mississippi. All right, Governor Reeves says the health of all Mississippians should be prioritized, especially those in rural areas, but without big government intervention. Take a listen. We need to incentivize quality health care in all regions of the state and protect the small town way of life that makes us who we are. We must do all of this without falling into the trap that so many misguided politicians cannot avoid. Big government intervention creates as many problems as it solves. That was the lesson of Obamacare. It is the lesson that, left, that many on the left, who are now pushing even more reckless expansion of government-run health care, failed to learn. It is a lesson that we must remember. This is not a call 
for inaction, but a call for caution. We can invest in health care. We should invest in health care. We can protect rural hospitals. We can protect the people of Mississippi. I am eager to work with each of you to do so. We can and we should do all of this without succumbing to the siren song of big government. A recent Millsaps College Chisholm Strategies poll indicates that uh, nearly two out of three Mississippi voters uh, want expanded Medicaid. Some say the speech seems to imply that Medicaid expansion in Mississippi is uh, off the table. So, uh, Austin, is there some common ground to be found on this issue? It's the same polling firm that said Jim Hood was going to win. But anyway, um, listen, what I have been fortunate to work with some different hospitals around the state, community hospitals, and their big focus is how do we continue to make sure that we're able to provide the proper amount of health care and expand access to health care. Um, that, that's, what, that's what hospitals are focused on. Community hospitals around the state, in many places, they are the lifeblood of these communities and focusing on protecting them and ensuring that they're able to grow and that they're able to, to remain strong. And then the ones that are not strong, how do we, what can we do to help them? Um, I, that, that's, that's what I think the focus should be on, not trying to um, expand a health care program that could potentially leave the state liable for tens of millions of dollars, if not more, every year. Governor Reeves' assessment of the effectiveness of Medicaid expansion was just not correct. I, I, would, I would like to urge him to think about governors like Governor Kasich in Ohio, Governor Pence, now Vice President Pence in Indiana. Um, they expanded Medicaid. Next door in Louisiana, they've expanded Medicaid. And what it's meant is rural care. It, it's also meant preventative care. Um, and so if in a place like Mississippi, when you think about our medical infrastructure, it would be a true game changer. And I think that that much is pretty well documented across the country. And so I'd like for him to reconsider it. I think we're going to continue talking about it. If it's a rebranding that it takes, if it's a little bit more time, um, frankly, we need it now. But hopefully he'll open up to that because I think those hospitals you talked about, Austin, they could desperately use it and certainly their patients could. Yeah, and I don't think we'll see anything this session with it. I don't know that we'll ever see expansion, but certainly understand your arguments. Well, Governor Reeves says one of Mississippi's greatest challenges is workforce development. He says he wants to invest in training measures to prepare the next generation for quality and better paying jobs. We're proud of our universities. We need bankers and doctors, journalists and lawyers. The big lie is that every American must embark on the same path. We can take advantage of this national myth because in Mississippi, we know that there is pride in a trade. We know that there is money to be made. We can let the East Coast have their ivory towers. We can let the West Coast have a generation of gender studies majors. We will take more jobs and higher pay. Here's what it will take, investment, and intentionality. We will not win this great competition without a financial investment in the people who can make it happen. Last year, I outlined a plan to put $100 million into workforce development, training Mississippians so that we are ready to work, teaching skills to students from the earliest possible age, apprenticeships, community college grants, and assistance for our workers. We can make noise across the nation when they see our commitment to this cause. I urge all of Mississippi's leaders to make this a joint priority. Mississippi has attracted people from a variety of educational backgrounds. Brandon, uh, what's your take on uh, the governor's plans for workforce development moving forward? Vocational training, VOTEC programs are, are crucial. Uh, and, and look, uh, Democrats in the legislature have pushed for mid-level funding for our community colleges for decades. And so the, the point is not lost that we need to make sure that folks who seek an alternative to four-year higher education have that path paved and that we're setting them up to compete in the global market. Places like Ingalls, places like Chevron, places like Toyota, we have places here that hire folks that, that have vocational training. 
But that was bizarre. That was just strange. Like, why do we have to take a swipe at gender studies majors? Why would you take a swipe at folks who are bettering themselves through higher education? It kind of plays into, I thought, the stereotypes of Mississippi. That was the only part of the speech that sounded like campaign Tate Reeves. And it, it was just kind of bizarre. Also. Yeah, I think I think he's making the point of people look down their nose at Mississippi from the from the left coast. Well, that ain't right going to help. <laughs> well, well, listen, but he's trying to make the point. Don't don't worry about whether somebody's you know belittling Mississippi on TV or looking down their nose. What you need to figure out is if you're a you know a 15 year old or a 25 year old who's thinking about sort of the next stage. 15 year olds are probably thinking about sports and girls. But anyway, you need to think about what is the right kind of trade. I don't have to go to a four year school. Maybe that's the four year college. Excuse me. Maybe that is the best pathway. But maybe I need to go figure out what is the votech. What is the specialty training that I can get? Really beginning at the latter stages of middle school and high school to help get me prepared so that when I get married and I have kids, I can stay here in Mississippi and I applaud the governor for what he's saying there. And I also love how he's tying it in back to education saying we need to start working as early as we possibly can with these kids to try to get them prepared. It was, it was <laughs> weird. I mean, you, you, can, you can talk about the honor in those jobs without uh, saying what he did. Anyway, it's a good speech. <laughs> And we have dissected it uh, on at issue. Thank you both for uh, doing a fine job as always. We are out of time. Don't forget you can watch this program online at mpbonline.org. For day-to-day -day coverage, follow MPB News on Twitter and Facebook. We thank you for joining us on At Issue. Have a good night.